And hello, hello, hello again, boys and girls. Welcome back to the channel. It's, of course, your host, Marley Startled. And today we are going to go over an issue I think I found with the Victoria Free economic system, which I found throughout the course of testing, uh, which I think really does negatively impact the game, and that is the use of subsistence farms. So if you uh, have followed some of the previous videos, uh, we've attempted to do several things. The first is, of course, trying to starve the world's grain supplies of Russia by trying to make the world dependent on our grain, which we did initially achieve, but once we blockaded the world, it didn't seem to have much of an impact. Then we also moved on to play as Spain and tried to destroy our country by building nothing and passing as many regressive laws as possible. And again, we couldn't destroy the country. And so I went into the nether regions of the Steam discussions and found that um, what effectively happens is that uh, any unemployed pop just starts going to subsistence farms. Uh, although the discussions did say that there's only a certain limit of subsistence farms each nation can have depending on its arable land, the concept or the big argument was whether or not that would actually have a negative impact on your population. And the argument was that in uh, Asia there wasn't enough subsistence farms or arable land to support the population. Uh, and that uh, there need to be more subsistence farms. Uh, so I did an experiment which was pretty much like Spain, where I effectively passed no laws, destroyed my entire industry, deleted everything, and um, basically turned my nation into a feudal hovel. Uh, well, I still have serfdom and all such that sort of thing. Uh, it's an experiment to see what would happen to my country. Uh, and really nothing does happen. Uh, your country cannot die, uh, so to speak. Sure, it can have revolutions, but uh, actually the, the way the game works, by being as backward as possible, you don't actually, you're probably more stable than your more developed uh, peers. But to explain this, we'll sort of discuss what a subsistence farm is. So a subsistence farm is what your pops go to if they don't have jobs or the cost of living is too high and they will simply go and live in a subsistence farm. This will then produce a base resource such as fabric, wood, grain or services, which then they can live off. What this means is that uh, you have effectively a safety net for your pops, meaning that they will uh, never really starve to death. Uh, and it means that you will never really have a grain shortage or anything to that effect, simply because um, if the cost of grain becomes too expensive, the peasants will simply go and work on a subsistence farm and make their own grain. Um, in theory, the idea behind that is that you always have a safety net and you'll never have massively big death spirals. If your economy suddenly pans or, or bins itself, or because of massive wars or because of a lack of resources, you don't have massive die-offs and revolts and revolutions. I think this is perhaps in, put in place to keep the AI going. Uh, so that the AI never, the AI, uh, European powers or foreign powers never collapsed. What this also means is that it pretty much destroys any attempt of existential crisis in your nation. Why this happens is because your country will never starve, it will never go without clothes, and it will never have a high, particularly, uh, well, particularly high mortality rate, uh, and your population will never really decline because you're there's always enough arable land in your subsistence farms to meet the demands of your lower strata. This means that you never have an historic situation such as an island with the Great Potato Famine, where, where the subsistence sort of economy of the Irish led to mass emigration abroad, simply because, unlike in history where the crop famine led to cause massive deaths in Ireland, um, what happens is in the game your pops just work on the farms and feed themselves and so you will never have mass emigration or mass casual, uh, population decline. So things such as disease or uh, starvation or famine is simply not coded into the game. You cannot starve opposing nations. You cannot drive your economy down so bad that they effectively lead to mass exodus or mass migration or a loss of population. This is a massive step back to Victoria 2 because if you recall in Victoria 2, uh, massive changes in uh, the wealth or, or um, well-being or standard of living of your population would mean mass emigration abroad, either to countries such as America. This is also coupled with the fact that the standard of living is only really affected by literacy. So as long as you don't increase the literacy, your standard of living will never get high enough to make the people living on the subsistence farm as ever revolt. So you can live like this for 
40 or 50 years and because your population is not literate uh, it basically means that you will not have revolution you could have played for 100 years as a backward anarcho-capitalist hellhole or a feudal monarchy and nothing bad will happen to you of course foreign powers may declare war on you but uh that's more for multiplayer really and the times when I did go to war was often just trying to open my market at. This leads to a potential abuse in the economic strategy because if you're playing as China say a multiplayer game uh, and you're going isolationism and they declare war on you, a uh, foreign power declares war on you, you can simply just destroy your industry and then they, they can't get anything out of you. They can't get any resources, they can't get any uh, wool, they can't get any um, dye or silk because you aren't producing any because all your guys are in subsistence farms. This means that you can literally, literally play a game and spike the rest of the world by simply not producing anything. And it doesn't really affect anyone anyway, because worst case scenario, the pops just go and work on the subsistence farms. And so it leads to a massive safety net in the game that prevents any massive radical changes in population. Now, again, we can compare it back to Victoria 2, where you could look at the demographics of nations at the end of the game and find these weird and wacky situations where perhaps constant war had reduced Germany's population to a couple of million, or because of constant emigration, most United States ended up being Chinese or something to that effect because the bad standard living in China caused everyone to emigrate. That would simply not happen in Victoria 3 because the local peasants don't starve to death or emigrate. They simply go and start working in the subsistence farms. Uh, and that is what I really found was a big disappointment. When you do try and break the system of Victoria 3, you just see how basic the system is. And things like the safety net of subsistence format farms does effectively limit the potential consequences and potential outcomes uh, of, of the economic crises or, or developments of nations in the game. Um, also, I think another point I found out is that it was almost impossible to reduce my population. So unless I was playing world war, uh, like literal world wars, it, my pop growth always remained high, even towards the end of the game. So I'm going to load up an 1870 game and my pop level only ever got to the minuses when I was fighting a massive war with the Heavenly Kingdom. What this means is that, again, the population demographics are not realistic. Uh, if I was living like this with literally no healthcare, no medicine, no institutions, I, I, I get rid of this towards the end of the game, like, like social security. I, I've been that in a, like, in a couple of years. Um, without anything in a literal feudal hellscape, your population just continues to boom, regardless of how much subsistence farms there are, simply because your subsistence farms always produce a surplus. This then, of course, has a massive effect on your demographic, uh, on your population. You see here, these guys are literally peasants. They do not have anything. They are not producing clothes, yet they're still only paying plus 2.9% of their money um, of, above average for basic necessities. You can see that they have enough grain by... They literally have more grain in this feudal economy than they do in a developed economy. And so the lowest strata are more than happy to live like this. The only thing they're still upset about is perhaps the opium, <laughs> which is bizarre. And then of course, even the middle and upper strata just simply don't care because they've just got enough money to buy the more expensive things. So you could go free trade as a backwards country like what I've done and destroy everything and have a extremely stable country because you do not have competing or competing demands and because the standard of living stays pretty much at the bottom no one kicks off about the change in the standard of living and so that's a big big issue so now i'm going to load up the 1871 campaign so this was about 40 years of me building nothing we had a few wars to open up my free trade market because the economically understandably powerful. You can see here that there is one manufacturing for buildings being produced and that's because of the war of the Heavenly Kingdom. The Heavenly Kingdom actually tried to build an industry and unfortunately I can't destroy this because uh, it won't let me because it hasn't been built yet uh, but uh, it's not even being constructed because I've paused it but again Apart from a few gold fields which I which manly occur and a livestock factory I caught oh I can get rid of the livestock factory there we go um with the Heavenly Kingdom my population still goes up it's still going up with the current existing arable land. It does not go down. Like There's not mass migration. There's no one fleeing the country. I mean, sure, no one is coming into the country, but no, there has been no collapse. It's insanity. Like the, the, the game is simply incapable 
of recreating massive famines or economic migrations or economic crises because of the existence of subsistence farms, because people would simply go and work there instead to feed themselves, which is unrealistic. If you're a small country, you have a massive economic crash like, I don't know, why why merge Germany? You end up with massive inflation and massive famines and massive loss of life, which uh, doesn't occur. And when there's civil wars in Victoria too, um, you can see your population collapse. Like when you're fighting and, and smashing down your population and doing as much as you can to fight off these hordes of rebels, you can see your population in real time go down by millions. In this game, you could fight a literal conscript army war of annihilation and your population doesn't really go down. You can see I fought countless wars with Russia. I fought countless wars with... This is the only part of the Heavenly Kingdom and that's only gone down because of course half the country was no longer under my control. But it's still been going up regardless of nothing, regardless of my development. And of course again we look at my population, they're in fact happier. They are in fact happier being feudal peasants with their supply and demand being literal serfs because they're getting the demands met by subsistence farms. And the upper classes and that, yes, they're paying more, but they're not kicking off because they're the ones in power. So the upper classes are happy because they're the ones in power. The lower classes are happy because they're happy living on the basics of their subsistence farms. And because, well, they're not literate, so they can't be unhappy. And the middle class is not developed enough to be causing any issues because you can't develop a middle class. Like there's no, like, the industrialists can't kick off, the petite bourgeoisie can't kick off, but simply because of the way that I have designed it. And of course you can argue that yes, militarily you are backward and you are vulnerable because of your research. But then again, with a hard research into military and with basic reinvestment into, in, into, into the arms industry, you could literally just do a feudal society of militia peasants equipped with modern weapons and you would be better off with this economy than you would be with a developed country. And it's because of subsistence farms. If you want the most stable nation in the game, don't build anything. Just don't build anything. Just go back in time. Like, look at my laws. Serfdom. So free trade is open because uh, I keep on being declared war and have my markets open. But even though I don't produce anything, so, I mean, go ahead. I'd rather, I'd rather you declare war me for this instead of actually taking territory. Serfdom's enforced. There's been no real progress. I've, I've taken away social security. Uh, we are as backward as we can get without slavery, but that's very difficult to enforce unless I get a petite bourgeoisie in charge, which is quite difficult to do uh, as China. And the game is simply broken, and it's because of subsistence farms. The subsistence farms act as a safety net so you do not end up with a national death spiral, but you should be safe. But by the very nature of the game, you would expect the massive holes in your economy, whether it's food crises or starvation, to be filled by other foreign powers. What subsistence farms do is it removes one of the key consequences of embargo, one of the key consequences of bad development, one of the key consequences of financial crisis, and it is an argument that indicates that the developers were not confident enough in their economic models to view, uh, to have, to go without that safety net. Because, of course, if you were confident in your economic model, you'd think that if there was a, stop, a food crisis, other nations would export food to that area. Or if there was a cloth crisis, other countries would export that um, cloth to that, to, to that market, unless they were using it as, a politi- as an economic weapon. But because of the subsistence farm, the evil, devious, disgusting subsistence farm, they, cannot, they can only wage a limited economic war upon you. Because if prices go up, your peasants just go to the subsistence farm and, and fulfill that deficit on your behalf. And that is a massive failing in the game. I mean, I liked experimenting and I liked seeing it, but once you peel back the curtain of Victoria 3 and look at its underlying system to see how badly can I break this and destroy my country, you realise that there are s- systems in place that deliberately hamstring your ability to role play or to actually sandbox the great greater economy of this time period. And that is because of the devious assistance farm. Uh, of course, you could argue that other nations such as Sweden and that can uh, also ha- have less arable land. But bearing in mind, I have a population of 442 million that's consistently grown, being supported by literally 8,800 subsistence farms like that can employ 3.4 million people. 
it's not that big an issue. I mean, they need to bounce subsistence farms or they simply need to remove them because subsistence farms in themselves limit the impacts of great famines, of great economic crises and, and, and limit the impact of radicalism or reform. Your, your population simply cannot starve in this game. Your population cannot starve in this game. They will either emigrate or they will go to the subsistence farm. If they cannot starve, which starvation was pretty much the bedrock of most revolutions, they can't revolt or they can't emigrate. I mean, again, I would bring back Ireland. A big case study for this time period was the potato famine and the massive emigration of Irish um, settlers to Argentina, the USA and other parts of the world because of the economic crisis by, well, simply not being able to feed themselves. But things such as famines, potato crises, or things like that, or food crises because of a certain subsistence farming system are simply not baked into the game. And so if you want to actually have a realistic game or a realistic uh, representation of the economic system and its consequences on a population, these need to go or become a lot weaker. But sadly that has not been done. And I feel the reason why is because the developers did not trust the AI to survive without this safety net. Simply put that, this is one massive safety net that always means your nation will always have a base level of stability. And so where do the revolutions come from? It, it doesn't really come from people starving, it comes from the changes in the standard of living uh, and of course events. Um, and of course, if your standard of living is always dirt poor, bear in mind that the ultra rich cannot buy anything and, they cannot, and the middle class cannot buy anything, but yet they're still painfully content it says a lot about the game and because of course i have 110 radicals but there's no one's going to radicalize no one's going to pass any laws because the radical parties simply aren't large enough or simply aren't a strong enough force in the country to do anything and it's just a really disappointing part um, this is just a video to bring out the issues of subsistence farms and bring out that if you're trying to if you've been looking at this game like it was some sort of big economic simulator that had a lot of complexity to it if you look at the base systems you find out that it's pretty flawed unlike victoria 2 you could crash your economy and have massive demographic changes and really screw your nation up population wise industry wise culture wise revolution wise in this country you can't you can probably change the color of your country and change it from one government to another via revolution and a reduction of standard of living but you will not face catast catastrophe uh, unlike uh, other nations. You will simply have a low GDP and a low literacy and a low standard of living and maybe you'll go down in a great power ranking but at the end of the day no one really cares and that's the real depressing part. I was a big fan of Victoria 3, I love it, I still think there's so much potential for it but the base systems without modding support or changes or without perhaps development by developers to change some of the base systems you realise just how basic the economic model is and how much the lack of faith the developers had in it to uh, and now allow things like subsistence farms. So how do they fix it apart from me complaining? Either A, reduce arable land to literally nothing. Uh, B, um, code in events such as famines that can really screw up subsistence farms' outputs uh, and, and really ruin your population or C, increase the mortality rate of people working as subsistence farms. So if you're working as a peasant farmer, you're going to have a low, uh, a low standard of living and a high mortality rate. Uh, D, increase uh, emigration, whether it's an illegal emigration or legal uh, emigration as, country, as, 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 as peasants try and flee to get a better standard of living elsewhere. Uh, uh, or C or D. Uh, and then I think the final one, is either reduce the base output of subsistence farms and most importantly actually tie in loss of casualties and loss of life to your population growth no one wants to emigrate to your population if there's a massive war and everyone's dying so how is the population growing when i'm losing millions of men literally throwing peasants at, at russian troops it doesn't make any sense if i'm fine fighting literal mass wars and my population still goes up or goes down by a fraction of a percent then that's a big, big issue. You see here that uh, you see a tiny dip after the war in heaven, but it's not a massive dip. Again, your counter argument will be, well, in the Great War, if you look at actual global population, it was a mere blip in, in terms of population growth. But that's a very, rather disingenuous argument in so far as that, that global population growth includes countries that weren't at war 
uh, such as Africa and some and, he, and and strong parts of Asia. Now, if you actually look at European nations and their population uh, impact, especially of the young adult male population, you will see it had a catastrophic impact on economy and industry and industry. If you look at the French in the Great War, I think they lost about 50% of their young male adult working population in the First World War. And this was had a massive impact on its economy and, of course, its future ability to wage war, which uh, some would argue is perhaps because of the horrors of the Great War, it led to a much more of a weaker response in the Second World, World War. Uh, at the same time, you could say that with the Russians losing 20 million men uh, in the First World War, this also had a massive impact on their ability to um, industrialize and move forward. And of course, the Germans, well, we all know the Germans, um, they had a massive economic issue and um, uh, it, because of the casualties suffered through great wars. And these things simply aren't being coded in. So that's the end of my rant, boys. Effectively, long story short, too long, didn't read. Uh, subsistence farms prevent any sort of complex economic simulation and acts as a safety net to economic warfare that makes the game basic and it's very uninteresting. And then there need to be several solutions to it that need to improve it uh, or it needs to be completely removed and coded out because it acts as a massive dampener on anything you can do in the game. Uh, anyway, that's it boys. Uh, oh yeah, I'll show you some things. So we look at my population cultures. Uh, bu -bu 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 population. There you go, they're all happy as Larry. Yep, these guys are right. And these guys are right, but they're not rioting or fleeing the country or rebelling at all. Uh, you can see most of my population is peasants, with the occasional labourer and occasional clergy person, and uh, most of my political strength from the from the aristocrats because it's a feudal society. Uh, and of course, we look at my cultures. Ooh, where's my culture? Han, Yu, Min. Yeah, it's it's pretty bruh, pretty bruh. So um, that ends my video. That's my little rant. Uh, about subsistence farms uh, tell me what you think whether or not it's a valid argument uh, whether you understood the argument and of course well you what you think they should do about it i think they should remove subsistence farms or they should really reduce or have massive penalties to subsistence farms via events mortality rate or uh, emigration um, because if you're getting to like 1871 and no your country has not collapsed or suffered because of your feudal anarcho-capitalist state then something must be horribly wrong with, with the basic economic economic system look there was nothing on the map it is a barren wasteland and yet somehow i'm the most stable country around apart from the war in heaven of course because that's an event but hey oh. thank you all for watching boys i hope you enjoyed and um i will see you all tomorrow i think i'm going to be uh, doing some recording for resident evil i, I believe uh anyway uh, here's some demographics. Oh yeah, let me t let me do this picture for you. So there you go, the joys, and let me just show the economic tree. Oh, that's me buying guns because I was desperate for guns. Um, <laughs> war in heaven. Uh, you can see there's no starvation in a feudal society for some strange reason, uh, and no one seems to be, in the remotest part, unhappy. It's insanity. Insanity. And that's all coming from farms. But hey, that's it, boys. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all later.